to do an entire lecture on conventions and conferences in science fiction and fantasy. Um, it is harder to find them in YA and middle grade. Sci-fi fantasy has this grand tradition of these conventions that you can go to. LTUE is coming up. That's one of those. Um, they are fan-run, uh, grassroots sort of things. Uh, they are great, but they're also very eclectic, and they're all volunteer-run. Uh, the step up for that, from that is something like Writer's Training Readers, which is more what we call a conference, which is you pay a certain amount of money to enter, um, and you get usually, um, I won't say higher quality content, I will say less variance to the quality of the content. Um, at, a, at your every sci-fi uh, fantasy con, you will go to some panels and you're just like, that is the most amazing, awesome thing I've ever seen. It helped me a ton with my writing. And then you'll go to other ones where Jerry Cornell yells at people. Um, and you're not really sure, you know, I'm using Jerry as an example of what could happen. Uh, Jerry's, Jerry's awesome, but you know, um, you, could, you could end up at ones where the panel is just kind of <coughs> don't stay on topic and you get nothing. Writer's Reading Readers will never be like that. You will get a very focused, high quality environment with professional lectures, and um, oftentimes there are agents and editors there that the authors are encouraged to pass up the better um, pieces to the agent or editor. There's a seat right here, by the way, um, open. Anyone else got a seat by them? Yeah, okay, there's some, there's some more over there. So, so there's, there's that, that's kind of, you know. And then there are also what we call the media cons, like, uh, like Comic Con, which is go and see the extravaganza, but it's not really useful for writers in the same way. We'll do a whole lecture on that. So, um, let's go ahead and start off. Um, and let me ask you guys how things are going um, with your writing, particularly those of you who are not in the, um, the workshop series. Are you running into any problems with your writing this semester? Are there things you would like to know about? Today we're gonna talk about plot in depth, but let me first uh, throw out uh, to you guys, what do you want to know from me? Any problems you've run into? It's all going really great? Everything's okay? Perfect? You're writing the, the, the next great American novel? Yeah? Where do you come up with your wild original ideas? Where do you come up with wild original ideas? Um, this is um, a difficult one for me to answer because idea generation is not something I've generally had much of a problem with. Were you here the day when we did the, um, on the board, we generated some stories? Um, I would suggest to you that you watch that lecture. Was it the first week? Yeah. Watch. Yeah, we're going to post these. Do we have the DVDs? Yep. Yeah, we're going to. We'll be posting. We have the DVDs. I'm just going to post them on my website. You don't have to get them now, but um, okay. we're going to post them on my website. If you watch that one, you will see how I uh, go with the class and together we brainstorm some character ideas. And I would suggest that you can try and use a model like that with some friends. Or a lot of times, for me, ideas generally come from. One of the number one places is I read something or I watch a movie, and I'm disappointed with how they handle a plot element or a character element. And I say, how could I take that and build a story built around that idea that they failed to accomplish that I would want to do in a way that's satisfying to me? Um, because my writing is a growth out of me loving stories when I was uh, when I was a teenager, loving these science fiction fantasy novels, and coming to want to be able to do that myself. And so when I see something that works, I say, that's awesome, I'd love to do something like that. If I see something that doesn't work, I say, work, I say that could have been awesome. How can I make it awesome? Um, but the, the ideas come from all over the place. So watch that lecture, see if that helps you out, OK? All right, any other questions? Yes? Uh, something I've struggled with mm -hmm. uh, with my writing group is I'll send them each version of my story, yes. but they have questions that I can't answer, but I don't know how to give them enough information that gives them a help them to understand without giving them too much. Right, giving them, you saying to your writing group directly or are you saying in your fiction? Well, they'll, like, they'll read the story and then they'll, then they'll be asking like, I don't like, this part was confusing, why does this happen? And sometimes okay. it's something that they'll find out in the future. Right, and then that's okay. Um, if people are asking that a lot, um, usually that gets to, and we'll do these two next and then we'll go to the lecture, okay? Um, usually what that means is you are not adequately explaining character motivations. Uh, this sounds like a character motivation problem to me. Not having the fiction in front of me, it's hard to diagnose 
And so I could be wildly wrong on this, but just when I hear that complaint, usually it means they don't understand why the character is doing what they're doing or why other characters are doing what they're doing to these characters. Sometimes it will be explained. You've got hidden motivations. But I would say that it's very important, particularly early in a book, the character motivation be made clear to the reader, which is why we had the kind of that lecture where we talked about the idea of give the character something to want. Find out why they can't have it and put that obstacle and make very clear, I want this and I can't have it. Even if the motivation is something very simple, like uh, Bilbo's desire to stay home and, you know, and have a peaceful life, and it's, he's thrown into all of this stuff, you can see how, as the story progresses, you know, certain acts he takes are motivated by wanting to just get out of there and not get killed. You can also see that he grows to have a different motivation, the enjoyment of the, um, of the, the quest. And that's where you run into, as a writer, into the dangerous area where the character starts not acting like themselves. At that point, you need to make this transition and say, here is the new motivation reader. Hint, hint, hint. They are learning to. And you need to leave those clues so that they understand this is what the character is motivated by, even when um, sometimes the character doesn't know. And this is very hard, particularly when it's, when it's something the character doesn't know. Um, and it is just a matter of getting across through strong use of viewpoint the idea of character motivations. We'll talk more during uh, the character lecture um, next week about doing this in specific, but that's what I would watch for if I were um, I used to be mostly a discovery writer, uh -huh. and my dialogue flowed fairly freely, and I'm okay. really loving the fact that I'm finally integrating a good, a good structure to it, a good uh -huh. outline, and I think it's really improving things. But I'm struggling with getting natural sounding dialogue that I have going to a, specific, a particular place. Right, right. right. Uh, <coughs> so you, you, you're getting a little on rails, and so now they are conversing about, you know, Maid and Butler stuff, or whatnot. Their conversations are starting to move the plot instead of just being natural. Um, that's a, I'm, I'm very impressed that you're able to pick out that that's what's happening and, and why it's happening. I would say that um, maybe this is a point where you want to practice doing things more consciously. You've got this natural instinct for dialogue. Go listen to people's dialogue. Go watch some movies with great dialogue and analyze why is this dialogue working, why is it not. When I've had trouble with dialogue, I go watch a movie that I feel has really solid dialogue of the style I'm shooting for. Really solid dialogue in a um, in you know an ideal husband is very different from really solid dialogue in a different type of film. You know, um, Oscar Wilde is shooting for something different from what someone else might be shooting for. But then sit and say, why does this feel natural? How is it advancing the plot while feeling natural? Um, and how is this expressing character with what they're doing? And it could again be a problem with motivations. If they're advancing the plot, but the dialogue is against who they really are, just need to get it across, then you've got a problem with why would the character even say this? Um, or if it just feels stilted, um, maybe you need to free write some dialogue from these characters to get their voices in your head, and then transition into the conversation you need to have. I've done that before as well, um, where you're just like, I'm just going to let them talk. Just let them talk to each other, say the things they would be, say. I'm not going to put any of this in the book. And then I will transition their conversation, hopefully naturally, into the discussion of the topic at hand, and I can slice that part out and stick it in the book. So just a couple of, I'm trying to give you tools, things you can try to improve, you know, to, to find the answer, rather than trying to fix the problem for you. Does that make sense? I, I search for tools or things you can try out. All right. What are some of the things you do to regain momentum or to fall back in love with the story? Oh, boy. <laughs> Excellent question. Uh, this is actually something that, personally, I've had some issues with. If I stop writing a book part of the way through, because I have to do something else, which never used to happen to me, and now it happens all the time, right? I'm halfway through a book, and then you know my editor from Tor calls me and says, you need to do these revisions that you've been sitting on for the last three months, Brandon, because if we don't turn them in, we don't have a book come out on publication date. I'm like, all right, fine. I will go do the revisions. I stop um, writing the first book, go do the revisions on the other one. By the time I get back, I'm like, ah, all my momentum is gone. Um, and this is a serious issue. Uh, for me, working on it, I've tried a number of different strategies, um, some of them with varying success. This is something I would ask other authors as well, because I'm not really aware of what other people are doing. One thing I do is I start with a revision, which I normally don't revise to be a book, but I just do a revision on what I've written already. 
and I dig into it, and sometimes that will get my mo uh, momentum going. I will sometimes do something which I very rarely do, which is I will skip chapters to find a point in the book where I'm excited about that, com that is coming up near, like something that's a more climactic moment rather than a setup moment, and I will write that chapter and continue forward with none of the setup in place and three or four chapters missing. This works for me really well most of the time, though it often creates a book that has some measure of disjointedness, not just because those chapters are missing, but because if I would have written those other chapters and I'd be going straight through, I might have written something different. And so at that point, I have to count on the revisions to smooth out and make the book feel like one book, as opposed to two slightly different books happening with the same characters at the same time. Uh, but this one tends to work very well for me. I did this on uh, Firefight. I skipped a chapter I'd been working on, just like, I need to get you know, beyond this chapter of setup because jumping right back into the setup is like jumping right back into the molasses, and I need to start with the exciting <laughs> bit. Um, so I added a new scene that hadn't been in my outline that felt, I, you know, just imagine, I was really excited about, and I took that as my new starting point as if I were starting a new book, but it was just half the size, and went forward with it. And that has worked very well for me, um, adding a new character. And writing a scene from their eyes can really revitalize the, uh, the story for me. Um, writing a short piece in the, the, that world, and then that can revitalize it for me. You've got a suggestion. Oh, one I've had is all up and I'll look up either writing excuses or what it's like. Mm -hmm. I should be writing a piece podcast that talks about a subject or something that I'm dealing with and that's mm -hmm. where I left off. And that'll get me excited for, oh, yeah, this is what I wanted to do with that. And it'll help me get back into it. Yeah. Any other suggestions from the audience? Okay, try a few of those things, see if they help. It is a big deal to me to try to avoid stopping my momentum part of the way through the book. Uh, it doesn't, it isn't a big deal for some writers. Oh, do you have one? Go ahead. Well, uh, well I, I have a new question. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, it's not a big deal for some writers. Uh, Ray Bradbury is famous for having a filing cabinet of half-finished stories. And every day he would sit down and be like, which one am I gonna work on today? And pull one out and be like, yeah, this one. And you'll type a little ways on that story. And then put it away, and next time pick out a different one. And write on that one for a little while. Something I could never do. I have to have this momentum. All right, we'll go ahead with this with this other question. Then we'll, okay. um, you talked earlier about avoiding cliches in your work. Is there yes. a way to use cliches properly? And if so, how do you, how do, you do that? Uh, it depends. Um, I would say that there are multiple ways to use cliches properly. It's, it really depends on what you mean by a cliche and the type of cliche. I would avoid the cliche turns of phrase um, like you avoid using um, said bookisms. Let's talk about, use this as an example. You know what a said bookism is? Um, this is the phrase used in the <coughs> for yada, 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 and then you have a word right here. And natural writer instinct is to change that word. Why? Because we are creative people, and we are working with our pros, and we're like, that word, we're using the same word over and over again. I can come up with a hundred different things to put here. He exclaimed. He um, postulated. Etc., etc., etc. You can come up with so many different ones. Um, the problem is that usually when someone is reading, as I have said before, they read only the dialogue and ignore a lot of the stuff around it. Um, particularly this part. They'll look to see who's saying it and they'll ignore what you say. If you put another word here, it will draw attention to itself and you will, then the reader will be kind of thrown a little bit out of the dialogue. Sometimes that's very helpful. You want to make that point. Usually you don't. Most writers, writing advice is avoid these, use them very infrequently. Um, J.K. Rowling uses them like every other time. So some great writers use them a lot. So cliches. How does this, what does this have to do with cliches? If there's cliche turns of phrases, the more of these you use, it's going to have kind of a reverse effect. It's going to make your writing a little more bland and a little more skippable. As opposed to this, when you use one of these things, it's going to draw attention to itself. The cliche undraws attention to itself, which makes your your turn of phrase or your writing a little more bland. I could see the argument for using a bland phrase if you don't want it to pull attention to itself. Usually, you're trying to avoid both of these <coughs> things and having some middle ground that is subconsciously powerful, yet um, on the page unobtrusive. 
This is kind of like the holy grail of prose, where your prose is creating this great vision of the story in their head because it is so evocative, detailed, and concrete, and yet you are never using the wrong word or a word that draws so much attention to itself that it becomes the star of the paragraph and everyone focuses on that word as opposed to what's going on. But I can see an argument for, hey, a cliche is a lot more invisible, so maybe we will use it at this point. Um, if you're talking about a cliche more of an archetype, for instance, the cliche I mentioned, J.K. Rowling, it is when she released Harry Potter, Boy Goes to a Wizard School was kind of a cliche already in the fantasy genre. Why is it not a cliche for her to do it? Well, she made it very much her own. She embraced it. She said, I'm going to write a really great story about this. Um, and cliches of our genre are things like, you know, the farm boy who saves the world. Um, the, you know, the, the grizzled veteran with a heart of gold. All of these different things are archetypes that stray into cliché. You can't avoid using some of them in your fiction. The question is, is it going to be yours, or is it going to feel like every other one? Um, the elemental magic system is one of the biggest cliches in fantasy and science fiction. And yet, Avatar the Airbender, the, the television show, um, did a fantastic job with it, and people loved it. Um, and in that case, it transitioned into archetype that's very understandable, instead of cliche, just like every other story that uses these same magics. And so, you know, Robert Jordan wrote an elemental magic system as well. It's very hard to see that when you read him, because you're like, this is his own thing. So, what is the cliche? And then kind of the last, um, another way you could do these is the whole subversion of tropes. Uh, that's when, you're like, when you say, I'm going to use this cliche, but then I'm going to turn it on its head. Be very careful about that one. The reason for this being that um, if, you, if, you, if you dally too long with this cliche, you are going to... Let me share a story with you. I uh, broke that into fiction in 2005 with a Elantris, and another writer, um, an LDS guy, I know, very nice guy, came out at about the same time. Um, Elantris really took off, and his book did not really take off. And we, years later, met, we were chatting, he's like, yeah, I could never really figure it out. What happened? Why um, did my book not take off and yours did? It wasn't sour on his part. He's a great guy. We were just con conversing about it. And I had actually read part of his book, and I'm like, your book felt really cliché, honestly. I, I'm sorry, but it, it felt like it was the same old tropes. He's like, oh, you didn't get far enough. And he started explaining it to me how he subverts all of those tropes by the end of the book and turns them on their head and does all these cool things with them. Like, that's really awesome, but you've got a problem. And I thought about that for a long time, and I realized, you know, personally, a, a, a take on that <coughs> idea, not to say you can't do this, but the problem is, all the people who are looking for a standard classic fantasy with all the tropes, what happens when they read that book? Disappointed. They get disappointed by the ending, because the ending ruins it all, in their opinion, because they've had this nice, very familiar book that then gets, gets destroyed. What happens if you do not like familiar fantasies and you're looking for something um, a little more out there? You put it down before you get to the cool parts. And so subverting tropes is dangerous because you have to rely on those tropes in order to subvert them. And you can walk this line very well, but you have to have <laughs> strong characters and you have to have promises to your reader that these subversions are going to be coming or that something they're going to enjoy, or you have to do it really quickly. Um, which is dangerous even of itself because a lot of people will put it down after one or two chapters. And it's like, oh yeah, I've read this book before. Um, I've read it too many times, so I'm going to put it down. So. Anyway, I have to move away from questions and uh, move on to the lecture for today. Um, and it does kind of relate into this, this topic a little bit, because we're going to talk about plot. And the, how various authors construct their plots, <coughs> and what really the essence of the plot is. I think what time is it? I didn't bring my phone. 5.30. 5.30, OK. So, plot. What is a plot? I've spent a lot of time trying to figure out in my head, what makes someone read a book? I wear multiple hats. Um, one of my hats is the writing academic, the student of fantasy, and particularly epic fantasy, as a literature form. I love thinking about it and uh, talking about it and, um, and all of these things. I don't wear a lot of, do a lot of this when I'm writing my fiction. I take off that hat and I put on the artist's hat. And the artist doesn't analyze as much in the moment 
as you might think of the artist would. The artist creates stuff by instinct, whereas the academic analyzes what those instincts are trying to do. So today I'm going to talk more about what the academic has come up with as explanations for why certain art works. And it seems to come down to two primary concepts to me. One is this idea of promises. And the second is the idea of a sense of progress. So, promises. I spoke about this in an earlier week. A book is really about this idea of, I am going to make some promises to you, and the book is going to be me fulfilling those promises with a measure of un. Results. Uh, I can't even write that. Um, unexpected results. Now, the balance between how expected and unexpected a story is really depends on the genre and your own goals as a writer. Let's talk about a book, the type of book that makes a lot of promises and fulfills them very expectedly: the Regency fan, uh, romance. <laughs> I would assume that most of us here have read or experienced one of Jane Austen's work or similar companion books. They are still written today. People like writing these books, people like reading these books. And a Regency romance is going to very quickly, in the first few pages, make a promise to you about the style of book this is. What promises does a Jane Austen book make to you as you are reading along? Yes? <laughs> What's that? It will end with, end with a wedding. Um, yeah, there will be a strong romantic really plot with resolution. Okay? Okay, so we're doing jail. What other promises? Lots of different female characters will love the different perspectives. Okay, okay. Um, most of them are one viewpoint. I wouldn't say necessarily. I would say that it is going to be, one of the promises is, it's going to have a strong, um, it's, it's going to focus on the female viewpoint. Yeah. How about that? Yeah. So, we'll tune that up here. All right, any other promises? You often know who will get it together, but you're not sure exactly how. Yes, you often know who the main character is. You know who is going to have the strong romantic resolution. I'm going to add one up here that's not coming out. It is going to be witty. From usually from, um, from paragraph one, you are promised that you are going to smile, as long as it's your type of humor. If it's not, it's not going to be your, your type of book. But very early on, you're getting these promises. And I would say these are, these are three very important core promises of this Regency, um, this Regency romance. And so, as your reader reads along, they are going to expect these things. And honestly, you, they don't often, you know, they're reading this book, they don't want, or at least the, the book is not promising them, a lack of resolution. They want it to be resolved. They want, in fact, in a lot of these genres, the romance genre in particular, the promise is they will hook up. I promise. It's like my six-year-old who used to get really scared watching certain television shows, even ones made for his age. And then he suddenly was okay with it. And I'm like, well, what's wrong? You're not scared anymore. It's like, oh, someone told me that Batman always wins. <laughs> and I, I'm like, oh, you didn't know that Batman always wins? Like, no, now I know. And he'll, watch, he'll turn on the show and he'll get scared and say, it's okay, Daddy. I know that Batman always wins at the end. <laughs> and then he can watch these shows, right? And they were too stressful for him to watch before he knew that Batman always won. And now he enjoys them quite a bit. And so for my son, who is six, it is a very big deal to him that he know the good guys are going to win. That is not as big a deal for some other re readers in certain genres. I would say that there is a promise inherent in, for instance, things like the Game of Thrones series, that the good guys might not win, and you're not even sure who the good guys are. And that promise is part of why people enjoy those books. All right? So, 
Um, this is going to vary very much. I mean, you can look at things like mysteries, where the promise is going to be, the you're going to know who did this by the end, and it's going to surprise you, which makes a very difficult task for mystery writers as they write these books and their fans get used to their storytelling style, finding out ways to still surprise and interest the readers. Um, so, making promises is about this. And we'll talk about how you make these promises in your book, but you want to start making these promises on page one. Paragraph one, if possible. Okay? Let's talk about the concept of a sense of progress. Sense of progress. Why do I write sense up there? Isn't it real progress? Well, no. Here's the thing. When you're writing a book, you have absolute control over everything in the book. You can make one second last 500 pages if you want to. <laughs> Anyone doubt that they could do this? It may not be fun to read, but you could do it, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, you could do that. Or you can pass a million years in three words. Millions. Years passed. Maybe four words. <laughs> Time passed. Two words. Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, and so you can squeeze or expand basically anything in your book. And this, I, we joke about the time thing. It can happen with any plot resolution as well. You can compress that plot resolution into a tiny little um, thing. You can be like, boom, and it happened. Or you can make it take hundreds of pages. And so. What they are reading for is a sense of progress toward the goals and promises that you have made. And your job to make an exciting plot is to give them this sense that things are progressing toward <coughs> or away from this goal. Motion is happening and we are making steps. The book is moving forward. If you do not give them this sense, they will say that your book is boring or they will say that it's not going anywhere. Well, every book, and you know, you could make anything boring and anything not go anywhere. That's actually not a flaw of the book not <coughs> having interesting things in it. It is a flaw of the reader failing to give the, the, the or the author failing to give the reader the right promises and the right sense of progress. For instance, you may have been promised a book with a really great action component or a really powerful mystery. And when you're writing, by about the first quarter, you can enter into this awesome romance and spend a lot of time with it. No matter how well that's, that is written, if you are making progress on the promises you've made, your reader will say, the book is meandering. No matter how tight that center plot is. And this happens in a lot of very great books that people read. And they're like, yeah, this part was just meandering. If you took that part on its own and read it, you'd be like, wow, this is tightly plotted. This is wonderful, and all these things, but the reader has made the wrong, or the author's made the wrong promises, and suddenly it feels like my book is meandering. So, sense of progress and promises. There are various tools, lots of tools, that different writers have used through the ages in order to kind of break up their plots and give these concepts across the reader. You may have heard of three act format. The reason three-act format works um, is, number one, it has some sort of intrinsic sense of, um, of motion to it. it has, um, it's going to force you, if you're using it the right way, to have things change. And so long as you've done your setup correctly, as you have things change according to your setup, then you will give a sense of progress. Three-act format. So, three-act. Any screenwriters in here? Yeah, okay. We've got a couple of you. Um, go ahead and, s oh yes, of course, the filming person. Someone <laughs> want to explain in quick words to us what three-act format is? Do uh, you feel capable of doing this? Go for it, three-act format. Uh, first act, setting up who our characters are, what the problems are, and introducing the heroes to the problem. Yeah. Sec second act, dealing with the problems and things going very, very bad, and generally ending on a very low note for the hero. And then the third act is fighting from that low note anyway, and usually trying to. Okay. Um, often there's also some sort of like call, up call up here and some sort of decision point right here. So, but not always, but that's kind of how it is. 
Um, so, um, like, uh, what's the tree one? Can you remember the tree one? Someone said three act format is what? Um, driving your characters up a tree, throwing rocks up the body. And get them down the tree. Yeah, so the first one's like introduce there's a tree, and then get them up it, or have them really, it's, it's hey, we've got to go find the tree. Here's a tree. We're going to climb the tree. Oh no, rocks are getting thrown at us. We get down on the tree. I don't know. They, they, there's lots of different ways to talk about it. The idea between three act format is breaking the story up to three pieces in your mind. Um, all your setup, they try things and it gets really bad, low notes, and then a, um, your Trump triumphant resolution. So how is this going to help with the idea of a sense of progress? Yes? Right, okay. It's kind of restricting you at least to spending one third of your book and set up instead of two thirds if you just split this down the line. Um, usually this is the biggest portion part of the um, story, by the way. I wrote them up here the same size, but I would actually say one quarter, two quarters plus, one quarter minus uh, is, is what your book is gonna, gonna fall into most stories. Hollywood loves this, this um, setup. Um, we are very conditioned to enjoy it. Um, and so, particularly in Western culture, we read these things and we like it. You will find that if you watch films from other cultures, <coughs> they don't follow this, they don't have the same traditions, and they make different promises inherent in their genre that we don't get. And we get to the end, we're like, my promises weren't fulfilled. He jumped off the mountain and fell into the clouds. I don't know what that means. <laughs> what does it mean? Whereas they culturally have different expectations and the genre is making inherent promises to them that isn't, aren't made to us. Um, so, hey. So, three act format. Um, I don't use three act format. I like what it does. Um, I think it's a great tool. I don't use it just because it's not natural to me. Um, a lot of the books that I'm writing are not falling as neatly into this, this package um, as they would, as, as normally like a film would. This works really well for a film because a film is two hours. It's really more of a short story. And whereas I'm often trying to write um, a big epic fantasy, um, three acts don't work for me. I, I'm, go, I'm working on some weird thing where I've got like 20 acts um, and things like that. But it is a very nice uh, model to practice. Let's talk about um, plotting using a very similar thing to this called the hero's journey. A lot of people use the hero's journey as a plot cycle. Does anyone know the hero's journey? All right, explain to me the hero's journey. I'm going to do it as a circle. Yeah. We're starting at the top. Uh, let me see. You start with uh, the heroes just like at home doing yes. his thing. Um, like uh, what did Newton's for law? Object at rest. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the hero receives a call which is refused. Call number one. And uh, then he receives a second call which he accepts. Call uh, number two. Usually, he's often he's forced. But yes. Okay. So call number two happens right here. Then what? Oh gosh. Um, that's about as far as I go. I'm sorry. And anyone else got number one in this journey? What's that? So right here, there is the loss of mentorship. Um, so training wheels come off somewhere around here. Obi Wan dies or whatever. It's different depending on where it is. Um, descent into uh, the underworld. Right. So this is um, kind of um, analogous to the low point, but it's more often when one's following the hero's journey. There's an actual place. George Lucas loves this thing. Luke descends into the underworld and meets Darth Vader. Right. You, this is. Um, he did the whole trilogy as a hero's journey, by the way. It's not the, the original trilogy. So it's that moment where Luke is down with Yoda, and he's passing through. This is um, Lucas's descent into the underworld. Um, but various is based off the idea of the classic Greek archetype. Often they will go to the underworld. And they will often meet evil version of self, <coughs> of some sort. They have to confront the evil within them. It can be external, or it can simply be some sort of, uh, sort, sort of, I could use this for evil, whatever. You come out, there's another thing here, what's it called, apotheosis? I can't remember, it's like the, the it's like the everything comes together. Yeah, apotheosis. 
yes, the force is within you, uh, whatever it is, um, the, you know, overcome, and then return home with new knowledge. Okay, so this is the, the hero's journey. Um, how is this going to help you with your idea of a sense of progress? How would they, is this tool help? I mean, how would this tool be able to help you? A lot of writers like to use it. Do you see anything that works for you? Well, if you're stuck with what do I do next, you can just look at the list and say, oh, I need to go, I need to descend into the underworld now. I need to get to the <laughs> Okay, yeah. <laughs> no. It just gives you the, the story beats that you're aiming for. Yeah. The story beats that you're aiming for are on this list. In fact, so much has been written on this and on three-act format. You can call them all up and go reading and be like, oh, this will help me. Oh, this will help me. Um, getting psychological, uh, this theory was developed as like an archetype. This is how yeah. we expect stories to be. Right. So uh, you've done correctly, this kind of progression feels natural and easy to, well, relatively easy to implement. Yes? Um, I think also because it's used so often, a reader will recognize it's happen happening even if they don't realize they're recognizing it. Yeah. So they'll feel the progress even if they don't know why. Yeah. So like, if you have a major character, it is expected to just die. Yeah. Uh, now, now let's go over here where I was going to get to next. But I'm glad you brought that up. You know what I'm doing now. You I do. So, thank you for the awesome segue into the next uh, portion of this lecture, which is these things that we're talking about. I like to talk about the mirror journey, but also works for a three act structure. Is this a checklist? And my answer to you is no. It should not be a checklist. These, the, the problem that we run into when we use uh, formats like this is that we are looking at something that scholars have described about stories in general, and they are looking for common themes. And any given example will not follow it exactly. However, when they look at a hundred different stories or a thousand different stories across cultures, suddenly this format comes about. The problem comes when you are then retrofitting your story. If you take your story and say, well, this is what makes a great hero's journey, I must hit every beat on the list in the order that they are here, you have turned what was a description of human nature into a checklist, and you risk creating something that really writes the soul out of your story, or that two horns in things that don't work. Um, I like to often use the example of the virgin birth. The virgin birth, virgin birth is a big part of a lot of the hero's journey stories throughout myth. And so what did Lucas do when he created the original, the, the new three movies? He made Anakin the subject of a virgin birth. That is so weird. It does not fit the lore and mythology he's created. It doesn't fit the story. It's bizarre. Um, you're like, what? <laughs> um, and it has no point in, or any place in his entire mythology and his story. It's just shoehorned in there. And once you start to say, I need to hit all of these things, you run the risk of that. Now, at the same time, it's hard to be too hard. It's wrong to be too hard on Lucas because he was telling the stories he wanted to tell. He was a big student of Joseph Campbell. He's done lecture series on Joseph Campbell. He loves this sort of stuff. And I doubt he was really actually shoehorning in. He was just like, I love this stuff. Let's put that in too. Let's put this in too. Um, and he wrote the stories he wanted to write. As a reader, I had a bad, or as a viewer, I had a bad response to some of these things that he forced into the hero's journey instead of building the story he wanted that, that was natural for his story. Okay? So any of these tools we're using, don't make them a checklist. Use them as a way to help you construct a plot, <clears throat> particularly if you're not naturally an outliner. This can be something that you sit down and say, okay, I can hit these major beats. They work really well for the person I'm telling. I brainstormed this character. I know who they are and what their, their emotional conflicts are, and I can overlay them really well with some of these attributes. I'm going to create a story that follows this, or the three-act format. This is helping me compartmentalize the sections of my book. I can now be like, part one, I've got to be done with introducing every important element by this page number. I'll get them all in. I'll have the call and the acceptance of the call. I'll have the, you know, the, the decision. I, I forgot to talk about the decision in that one. Between part acts one and two, it's kind of an important moment. Usually, at some point in act one, the protagonist goes from everything but from being forced 
to do things to deciding they want to do them. And this, um, again, is sort of the idea behind, behind Bilbo being forced to go on a quest and then deciding he really does want to be on the quest. That sort of thing is what we're looking at for that. And there, that decision point is somewhere in that first act, second act transition. Not really as hard fast a point as the line I put there, but you, you can use that and say, oh, okay, I need to transition my character from being um, inactive to proactive. We talked about the idea of character, and we'll talk about it more, what makes a, a, a really exciting character, and so proactivity is one of them. You want to make sure you're starting with them having one of the other two, at least, um, but you can then transition to proactivity. These things hopefully will help you if you are trying to construct a plot, but don't take them too literally. Okay. Now, when I'm doing this, one of the things I like to do particularly because I am creating large-scale plots, is I like to divide up my plots into lots of different subjects. Um, let's stop that one for a minute. There's one more I, I want to talk about. I want to talk about scene sequel um, before we get on there. A very simple plotting method, because then we're going to get into the complicated ones. So, if this sort of stuff, you look in this and you're like, okay, I can understand that, but how do I make things happen chapter to chapter? You use what is called scene sequel storytelling. We talk about it on Writing Excuses, you may have heard this. Um, a very simplified version of it is the, um, Mary gave this to me, yes, but, no, and. This is a very simple plotting method. You can use this as you're writing, or you can use it to construct your plot. Yes, no, but, um, yes, but, no, and. The idea is you start with a problem, and you have them try. What's a, what's a simple problem? Come over with a simple problem. Missing. My cat's missing. Okay, great. My cat's missing. All right. You're going to write a story about my cat is missing. All right. What are we going to do so we want to try and find our cat? We come up with to something the character can try. What's that? Go to the pound. Go to the pound. Okay, we go to the pound. All right, we go to the pound. Do we find our cat, yes or no? No. No, no. okay. We, it's a no, and what else goes wrong? Uh, what's that? I can only set free all the other animals. Okay, I like that one. <laughs> no! And we let them all go. What do we do to try and stop the, to, to solve this problem? <laughs> Come on, active. What do we do? Grab the big net. And back, go ahead. Hire an uh, animal catcher. Okay, we hire an animal catcher. <laughs> Wait, does it work? No. Yes. 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 They capture all the animals who got free. But what bigger problem does this create? Our cat wasn't there. Decided to keep your cat they cat sell them to a food market. It's actually the evil cat bounty hunter. <laughs> Kind of an interesting story. Yeah. So, Evil Cat, can you see how this is going? Now, if you're doing this really well, you're going to weave this thread in. They, you know, yes, they caught him, but they're an Evil Cat Bounty Hunter, and they've already sold your cat to the, uh, to the food market. Then, you know, you try to solve that problem and things like this. The concept between this is to force yourself to have an escalation of problems. And you keep doing this until you finally say yes, and then there is no but. And that's the end of your story. Very simple plotting method. The concept behind this is to force you to create more conflict and to have a sense of progression. You got to throw some yeses in there. All right. Now, a lot of great books you will read, uh, Miles Burkosigan books, are like this. You can kind of see the, the styles. Anyone read Warriors Apprentice? Uh, Louis Bujol. It's a great book if you haven't read it. Um, and it is kind of this style. Ender's Game is a little bit to an extent too, where you keep doing things, and for every problem you solve, it creates two new problems. Um, and you keep trying and doing things, but they don't work, or they do work. Indiana Jones movies are all like this, right? It's just like a se series of everything getting worse and worse, with occasionally you think you solve something, and it gets even worse, and then finally they pull it out. That is how you kind of use that. And it's a very simple plotting method. The idea behind it being 
conflict and progress. All right, so let's do some, uh, some more complicated plotting methods. And before we do this, I want to dig into the idea really deeply of the, of the promises and the progress. Because what I like to do is I like to divide out the types of plots that I often include in my stories. And I'm dividing them up by the way I'm going to set, create a sense of progress. I'll give you an example. One of these is the mystery. This doesn't mean that I'm writing a mystery book. This is a type of plot that is sometimes included as a subplot. A mystery, for me, is a plot about information. OK? A plot about information. Now, why I'm, I'm saying this this way is, when I'm going to create a sense of progress, the way to create a sense of progress, how do you create a sense of progress when, it, when, when if information is your key? You give out information equal clues or research or information being found. And so if you have set up a promise of there is a mystery, you fulfill that promise by creating clues along the way and at the end, discovery. So you have your steps and you have your resolution. This is where sometimes authors can give mixed signals by accidentally promising something at the beginning of their story and then fulfilling a different type of plot or having the discovery, often when it's really bad, they do something like this. They know they have a mystery, they set out the mystery, they make the big climax of discovery, but they have not given a sense of progression in the middle working toward that discovery. And this is when a plot really misfires. And so the idea is to match your, your, the way you're progressing your plot with your hook at the beginning and your big rebel resolution at the end. But these are, in a, in a lot of books, you're going to have a number of these. What I try to do sometimes um, is this idea of brackets. I talked about this before. Um, the brackets are, we introduce problem one, problem two, and problem three. And they might all be different types of plots. Problem one um, is, well, let's, let's break this down for something like, um, like what's a good sh show we've always seen? So we do Star Wars? Firefly. Um, Firefly uh, has episodes, so it's a little bit difficult for, let, let's do, so we do that, or you want to do like, um, yeah, just do yeah. Star Wars. Uh, Harry Potter? Yeah. Harry Potter. Okay, let's do book one of Harry Potter, okay? So we introduce a problem, right? What is our problem? He lives, lives under the stairs. So this is kind of our initial one is life sucks. <laughs> right? So we've kind of introduced the sort of life sucks problem. Um, what's problem number two? I would say adapting school. Maybe you could give different ar arguments here, but there's a, this whole di idea of the apprentice story, right? The uh, problem is, I am not very good at this. Um, I'm in I'm a new, new thing. And then problem number three is Voldemort, right? And we do it as sort of a little sort of thing like this. Um, now, in Harry Potter, I would say that um, that as the book progresses, we kind of we don't get this one solved, which is kind of interesting, right? The life sucks. We get a little bit of help with it. But this one is almost solved right here as a middle thing of life sucks, by the way, you're a wizard. <laughs> okay, life doesn't suck anymore, but we've got this big school life problem. But the idea is you kind of start bracketing these things. Then we find out this mystery. And then the mystery gets solved in the middle, right? Or near the end. And then, so really it's kind of like mystery. Um, and Voldemort is another problem. Oh, there's Voldemort. Oh, there's this mystery about the, what's the first one? The philosopher's so stone, right? Mm -hmm. We solve the mystery. Then we fight Voldemort. Then we, um, have, then we win the school cup, right? We have solved the school life problem. We solve the mystery. We beat Voldemort. And we kind of break them back outward. Now, this may look, make it look like your story is going to follow, you know, that you're getting equal time. Really, when you're bracketing, you're doing it like this. Here's your brackets. And then you have your big story, and you might have little brackets of small conflicts. And then these three brackets are right on top of each other at the end in a sequence. You can kind of see it with Harry Potter, right? They kind of follow the exact thing. Mystery solved, Voldemort beat, 
we, um, we win the cup, school life is great. Um, and so the idea is if you kind of identify what your little subplots are and resolve them basically in the same order, you're able to create these little um, nested plots. All right, so let's talk about other style of plots. We've got the mystery. What other type of plots can you imagine? The romance. Okay, I'm going to put, um, I'm going to call that not romance. I'm going to call that, um, um, because it works between two um, non-romantically involved characters, too. It's the, what do I call it? Relationship. Relationship. Relationship, that's what it is. <laughs> I can find that word. What does that mean? Why would I say that we call it a relationship plot? Well, I would honestly tell you, go watch a buddy cop movie and a romance movie, and you will find that the beats and the plot resolutions are exactly the same. Okay? Um, except for the cop movie having a bracket on the outside that is action. So there's going to be an explosion. But bracketed inside of that is a bromance. Right? And that's what the, most of your movie. Um, is, is this. And if you follow that, go do it sometime, you will see that they have the exact same sort of beats that happen in the romance plot. So what is, how do we give, what is our equivalent to plot about information? What's this plot about? What's it about? What is it in one, like, what is the plot about? People get, learning to like each other. Right? Becoming friends slash Romantic. Involved. Falling in love or falling in friendship, whatever you want to call it. Um, so, you know about this, so how do you send, give a sense of progress? Okay, that's, that's, a, um, that's a, a wrench you can throw into it, but that's not the sense of progress. What, what is the sense of progress? Mm -hmm. Moments together. Right? You need to be finding, just like over here, to get the sense of progress, you need to be delivering times where clues are discovered and thought about. You need to be giving time for these two characters together. And as, uh, as you said, sometimes they're going to, at the beginning in particular, you need to set up a problem. Over here, the, mis the problem is we don't know this. Over here it is we drive each other crazy often, right? It doesn't have to be, but the most archetypal version of this is, you know, we hate each other. This is, um, this is Mr. Darcy. He is the most insufferable man ever, right? Or, this is, your new, uh, this is your new partner. He's completely insane and he might shoot himself. Um, let's leave the weapon, right? Um, you, you put two characters together who are forced to be together for some reason, if, even if it's just this is the story, and you then give them moments together and your sense of progress is changes in the relationship. Now, you can throw wrenches into any of these. In fact, you probably want to. Any plot that we're going to be talking about, you want to have red herrings. You want to have things go wrong. You discover information, but then you find out that the informant who gave you this information was lying to you to manipulate you. Or, you know, um, whatever, yada, yada, yada. Usually, it depends on if you're using three-act format, you look for the third-act crisis, right? Um, this is, oh, it's a good one, Hitch. What's the third act crisis? Someone's you know, ever seen Hitch? The Will Smith uh, romantic comedy. Um, third act crisis. She finds out he's a relationship doctor and she thinks she's been playing, he's been playing her all along. Boom, crisis. Our relationship was going real well, now boom, it's off. Right? Um, and, and these sorts of things. You can find it in all sorts of stories. Um, if you, I mean, they do this a lot in comic books too. The Fantastic Four. They, every comic book you'll read by them, they break up near the end of the comic. You know, the, the thing and uh, Johnny are pounding on each other and they break apart. The whole team's dissolved. Nothing's working anymore because those, those are basically relationship comic books with this sort of action veneer, which is different from, for instance, something like a, um, like a Batman comic, which <coughs> these days usually isn't involving any sort of relationship except um, Bruce Wayne's relationship with his psychoses. Um, so, right, relationship block. Does that make sense to you guys? Now, again, you want to be careful not to cross your wires. That doesn't mean you can't do multiple things. In fact, 
I want you to be doing multiple things. But if you want to have this great ending where they get together, you're going to have to have had time together where you give clues to the reader that this is progressing, a sense of progression. Um, one of the best examples of a book that had sort of an arbitrary sense of progression that worked for me, I like to often bring out, is um, the idea of a book called Inferno by Larry Niven and Jerry Cornell. I really like this book. It's a fantastic classic of science fiction literature. I might love it so much because it's about a science fiction writer who gets drunk at a science fiction party. <coughs> the party of science fiction caught and falls out the window and dies. Um, <laughs> he then gets sent to Dante's Inferno. Yeah. <laughs> Wakes up like on the outskirts, like in a bottle or whatever it is that happens on the, in the Inferno. And what happens, what follows, is a sequence of sometimes unrelated episodic quests, right? This is the question, how do you do with something at the side? Because these can make fine stories. You will read some books that are like this, where you're like, Brandon, there are no big brackets. Or if there are, is one, they're very loose. And everything is this, 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 this. And that book is very much this, 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 this. Even if his general goal is, you know, get out of hell, how do you give a sense of pro progression on that? Well, um, Jerry Cornell and Larry Niven very wisely did something very simple. They put a map in front of their book. Maps have become very common, kind of sort of synonymous with the, uh, the fantasy novel. Um, this one's a science fiction-ish. I don't know what you call this one. Um, <laughs> theological fantasy. Um, but it was a map of the Inferno, which was a circle with a center point and him starting on the outside, and it went like that. And each of these episodes, you were able to look and say, hey, I see on the map where he is. Suddenly, this book is giving, despite being really episodic, a sense of progression because we are targeting toward this central thing. And this is a, um, a sort of plot archetype that we usually call the travel log. And so this is a travel plot. Very easy one to imagine. The travel plot. What um, is your your progress? <laughs> Places. Yes. Point A to point B. And this has a grand tradition in fantasy, partially because of Tolkien. If you read Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, they are fairly episodic. We go here, we meet this. We go here, we meet this. We go here, we meet this. And it gives a sense of progress by, at the beginning, very, giving us a very clear delineation of what our goal is. Yes, it's going to be a lot of this, but Frodo, if you don't throw that ring in that hole, then everything ends. So go get to that hole, right? Um, and that hole is way over here. Sorry, dude. Um, <laughs> yeah, the Eagles are on coffee break. So, um, so you get this sense of progress by having adventures along the way, and the end is where you arrive, where you're going. Let's stop for a minute and talk about this unexpected result. Because Lord of the Rings has a fantastic example of an unexpected result. Um, I've talked before about the idea that in storytelling, we are blending the familiar and the strange, or the expected and the unexpected. It's a great essay about this called The Strange Attractor by Terry Rossio. Rossio? I'm not sure how to say his name. He's a screenwriter for a bunch of pretty cool movies. Um, Aladdin was one of his with his screenwriting partner. Um, and so were the Pirates of the Caribbean movies and things like that. Um, and he has a big series of essays. This one's now some 10 years old or something. But it's a great essay about the idea of mixing the unfamiliar and the familiar. And you're going to have to decide what your mix of the familiar and unfamiliar is for a given book. We read fantasy because we, in science fiction, we generally like this idea of a steep learning curve, and we like a lot of unfamiliar in our setting. That you can take to say, well, that means I can be very standard in my plot. And you really can if you want to. I was talking with one of my friends in writing group once, my writing group, and she said, I feel like my books are terrible because I read your books, Brandon, and your books kind of, you know, you have these many characters, and you have these many plots, and then your book goes like this, <laughs> and then they all come together, and boom, there's this big thing at the ending where it's like, oh, it's all related. Um, 
And she said, and my thoughts are, I really wish that I were married. Oh, I'm married! <laughs> <laughs> Which her books are way more complex than that. But it's really more like, you know, this and this. Like that. Okay? And she, and, and she said, so I feel like I'm failing as a, as a writer. The thing about it is, her books are fantastic. They're the light to read. I love every moment of them. Um, and my explanation to her of this was the idea that if you are making promises and fulfilling them, one of the promises that you get when you pick up the Way of Kings is that promise is you have four different characters in four different scenes in four different places at the start of the book involving crazy magic. You are being promised this book is going to involve lots of characters, it's going to involve a steep learning curve, and it's going to be a little bit like this, particularly at the beginning when you, you know, you're having, you're like, where is this all going? That's a promise I make which makes a substantial portion of people who pick it up put the book down. Okay? That's what I expected. It is what I did intentionally. Um, I wouldn't say the majority, but there is a significant portion of people who do not want to read this. And I understand that completely. That's why I wrote the book the way I did. These books, there is nothing at all wrong with this. In fact, one is not better than the other. They are different storytelling archetypes. And if your promise is, if they're going to get together and then they don't, I'm going to feel like that I was let down by your book because I'm loving this book and these characters and I want them to get together. There's nothing at all wrong with that. Um, and we have this sort of sense sometimes as writers, the deeper we dig into this, that for some reason we have to do things unexpected <coughs> just to be unexpected. Well, no, not necessarily. At the same time, if you are making promises, like your mystery, uh, if you're making interesting promises with your mystery, the more interesting your mystery is, the more full of the mystery, um, the more awesome the questions are, the more awesome the resolution we're going to want in order to feel satisfied. Did anyone watch the TV show Lost? Okay, TV show Lost um, was a very well put together show. Um, they did some awesome things with character. Um, but the biggest complaint, if you read online, is that people felt that the mystery re resolutions at any given point in the, in the show were really bad. <coughs> they had big problems with this. Um, and I'm just going by, I'm not making value judgments, going by what the reader response was. It was still a wildly popular show. People loved to read it. I think it's because they really were not a mystery. They were a character relationship show with a bracketed mystery thing inside of it, and they were really good at asking questions, but really bad at giving unexpected answers, in that the answers were either too unexpected, so they weren't foreshadowed, so you didn't have that sense of progress to them, or they were just more questions. Um, and so, to, if you run into this problem, this plot doesn't run into that problem. This plot says, here's what's gonna happen, it's gonna, we're going to have some unexpected things happen, but at the end, you're getting what you signed up for. And there is something very, um, very important to understand about that and to, to be aware of. All right, what time do we have? 6.16. 6.16, so we got about 10 minutes left. All right, that's good. We're right on target. So, <coughs> so just be aware. You're going to have to decide unexpected <coughs> results. Um, Lord of the Rings is the one I used as an example because I think it has a fantastic mix of this. When you get to the end and Frodo keeps the ring, that's an unexpected result. You've been promised he's a hero all along, and yet you have he has bracketed a different type of plot. What is the plot that has been bracketed inside Lord of the Rings? A fall of grace. It's an internal conflict. It's an internal personality conflict. So. Uh, Character or character conflict. Right? So you have bracketed in this sort of thing. Um, you have this, we introduce when you get this, this part, and then a slow and at times not so subtle corruption of Frodo as a sense of progress, which at the end, your climax is he keeps the ring. And this works wonderfully because. As you're focused on the main plot of get from point A to point B, you can kind of <coughs> ignore this one. Not really, you're paying attention to it. But there's this thing in writing where we are a lot more like stage magicians than you might have assumed. One of the things we're trying to do is hold up an idea over here and say, look at the monkey, here's the monkey, while we're palming something else in our hand and slipping it in our pocket. 
That's what we call foreshadowing. We are doing foreshadowing in a way where we're being distracting as we do it. And when we talk about plot number two, we will talk about foreshadowing. As we write that down, make sure I get to it. Because that's kind of what our, our, um, we're going to talk about when we get back to this. Now remember, we're going to do a rotation. Next week will be character, and then the week after that um, will be setting. And then we'll go back and do another prose week, um, another plot week, another character week, another setting week. Um, and that's basically how the class is going to play out. Um, so, but you are a stage magician. You are trying to distract people. And one of the ways you can do that is by bracketing these, these plots very, um, very cautiously. Now, you can probably come up with a ton of these. The character conflict one is there's, a, there's an internal thing that I need to overcome. I'm too shy. I'm too brash. I'm not brash enough. Um, whatever it is, you have a character conflict inside. Um, you know, villains killed my parents, and now I'm a vigilante. Right? Um, but whatever your internal conflict is, and you are going to give a sense of progress through showing that issue affect other parts of the plot in negative ways. And then the character is going to, you're going to show them working on it, and you're going to come to a resolution where they defeat it or not. That's a character conflict sort of thing. It's very intrinsically tied to character. You can probably come up with a ton of these. Right? I'm not going to go over all the different types that there are today. The goal right now is to have you start thinking about this and start identifying what is my plot promise. What, is, what promise do I need to make in the beginning? If I can in the first chapter or two, what promises am I going to make about the style of story this is and the main plot, the first of the brackets? And then how am I going to give a sense of progression through the course of my book? And then how is my, um, my resolution going to fulfill that promise and make use of all these things, these groundwork that I've laid? That's what I want you to be thinking about. Now, when I actually use all this stuff to con construct a plot, I use a method where I have opened up my new document. That is my notes document, my about the book document. Uh, I call it a book guide. And I will have put the heading of plot. And then underneath that heading, I will start identifying subplots. I'll say relationship here with these characters. Uh, relationship here with these characters. Um, we have the you know the big problem. As I've said before, it's my catch-all. We need to accomplish this big goal. We need to rob the Lord Ruler, um, <laughs> which is really a heist, is what that is. Um, we've got this heist plot. If you want to kind of sub narrow it down, um, we've got an apprentice plot. You know, training. You know, we've got the training plot is uh, Ben needs to learn how to use magic. Um, we have, um, what's another big one um, in Mistborn? Uh, what's that? Relationship. We have the relationship, yeah, Ben and Ellen. We have the relationship, Ben and Kelsier. Um, building a rebellion. Building a rebellion, yeah, big problem, we need a rebellion. Um, so I'm identifying all of these things, right? Oh, mystery, yeah, mystery. How do we kill the Lord Ruler, right? Mystery. Um, and then these are kind of my bigger ones. There will be little tiny ones chapter by chapter that I'm not plotting out the same way. But I'm doing all of these things, and because I am a, um, an outliner, I have to have an ending in mind before I start. If I don't, I, I don't write my books the same way. And it, um, Sometimes I'll do it, but most frequently I need an ending. Not everyone does this, but I need an ending. So I decide how these things are going to play out. I can change this as I'm writing the book, but I decide what my cool endings are. And I'm usually just starting the first couple ideas I have over. I spend a lot of time brainstorming what would be what we're looking for, this idea of I love the surprising but inevitable, right? It's a great phrase that people use in screenwriting. When that ending comes, you say, I can't believe that happened, but it was there all along. Frodo keeping the ring is a great example. I can't believe that happened, but yes, it was obvious all along. In fact, you have that mounting sense of horror right at the end, um, things like this. I look for ideas that are going to be like this, and then underneath this plot, I will brainstorm my steps. Um, things, I will construct scenes and say, okay, I'm going to have this relationship. I need scenes with these characters together. What are great scenes that will interplay these characters in interesting ways? Oftentimes, by the time I'm doing this, I will have written a chapter or two to get the character um, who they are under my belt. Not always, but often. I'll write a chapter and be like, all right, who is this person? I know this scene. I know who, how they think. Sometimes those are end up in the book. Usually I make them chapter one and then I cut them. Um, anyway, I'm doing all these bullet points underneath all of these things. 
And so my outline is a, sit, a list of goals and ways that I'm going to fulfill those goals, wrenches that I'm going to throw in. And then I kind of build a plot by using these things and kind of ordering them in a big long list of bullet points taken from over here. And I will combine three of them and say, in this one, we are going to have, uh, Ben and Kelsey here have some time together. We are going to have Ben learn to use the magic. And we are going to ask questions about the mystery and maybe try and dig on that. What can I do to make these three things turn into a chapter? I will then write a chapter, come up with a scene, come up with, um, with, uh, with a setting, and start writing. And that's how I build books. Take a bunch of those bullet points, build a scene out of them. My method is, doesn't have to be your method. I'm just showing how I have personally taken all this stuff and applied it into an actual plotting methodology. You may want to use the points of the map method that we talked about before, where you're like, I know I'm going here, I know I'm going here. I don't know what's got it, what happened to get between, but I can now that I know what my goal is, I can write underneath it, okay, I'm going to travel along this way, and here's some things that happen along the way. At some point in my discovery writing, I have to accomplish this goal. Go. And giving yourself a few goals as a discovery writer will probably help you have more powerful endings. We'll talk about characters next week, specifically about making sure that your characters are vibrant and alive um, and sympathetic. All right? Uh, are we out of time, Isaac? 625, we're good. Off you go. Come talk to me if you have any questions or problems. I'll meet the workshop class next door.